Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, April 20, 2022. Uh, my name is Kevin Flynn. I am the chair of the board. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, Melinda, can we do the roll call? My understanding is there are no new members or alternates uh, in attendance tonight, correct? That is correct. And um, yes, I'm more than happy to go ahead and start roll. Uh, I'll just make a- Excuse me, that, oh, that, isn't, that isn't correct. Uh, this is Roger Hudson. I'm in for Deb Mulvey tonight as an alternate. Ah, okay. Thank you. I knew that Deborah was not going to be here, but uh, 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 Director Hudson, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. Thank you, Roger. Um, yes, so we, uh, I will go ahead and start roll. And for anyone that's still being brought over, uh, we will at the end, ask again if you hadn't, you weren't able to respond at the time your name was called. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started and we'll go on from there. All right, so Steve Odoricio of Adams County. I'm Lynn Baca, the County Commissioner, and I'm uh, an alternate for Adams County. We'll give you be in place for Steve. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Matt Jones of Boulder County. William Lindstedt, City and County of Broomfield. I'm here. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal of Douglas County. Abe Layden of Douglas County. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Here. Lisa Smith of Arvada. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Nicole Spear of Boulder. Junie Joseph of Boulder, Margot Ramsden of Beaumont, Jan Plowski of Brighton, Adam Cushing of Brighton, uh, and as we've established, Deborah Moley is absent this evening, and we have Roger Hudson in her place, so thank you, Roger, for joining us of Castle Pines. Thank you. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Thank you. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Susan Noble of Commerce City. Jim Torini of Decono. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Good evening, here. Thank you, Othaniel Sierra of Inglewood. Steve Ward of Inglewood. Ari Harrison of Erie. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen of Federal Heights. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Here. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Paul Hazeman of Golden. Here. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Here. Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherezai of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Kyle Schlachter of Littleton. Jamie Jeffrey of Lockbuoy. 
David Ott of Lock Bowie, Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree, here, Joan Peck of Longmont, here, Ashley Stolzman of Louisville, Kyle Brown of Louisville, Nicholas Angelo of Lyons, Holly Rogan of Lyons, present. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Present. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Christopher Larson of Nederland. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Jenny Wilford of North Glen. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. I'm here. Sarah Nermella of Westminster. Bruce Baker of Westminster. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Sally Chafee of CEDA. Here. Rebecca White of CEDA. Bill Van Meter of RTD. All right, and um, at this time, if there's anyone still left over in attendees, I would ask you to raise your virtual hand and let us know you're here. Okay, I do see that Sally Daigle and Sarah Nermella and Bud Starker are present. Um, I also see that Rebecca White was not able to respond, Claire Levy, Nicole Spear, and Nathaniel Sierra. Um, so at this point, Mr. Chair, I will turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we obviously have a quorum. Yes, sorry. I would like to move to uh, item three on the agenda, which is uh, to solicit a motion from the director to move to approve the agenda, if I could have a uh, hand raised to do that. Uh, Melinda, you see the hands raised. I see uh, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will make that motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Uh, a second, please. Don't all rush. Second, Harrison. Second. Uh, Director, Director Lindstedt, we're still using uh, the, the Zoom raise hand feature. Second. Uh, for that, thank you. Uh, Director Lindstedt, I had. Uh, the uh, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor of uh, approving uh, the agenda, please say aye. 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 If anyone is opposed to approving the agenda, please say no. <laughs> that always amuses me. Uh, all right, we uh, have uh, we have the agenda approved. Next item is report of the chair. I have a couple of items that I want to do. Uh, I can find the right screen here. Uh, first of all, thank you. I want to thank everybody who came to the retreat on April 2nd back at the Dr. Cog office. Uh, I have to say that compared to some of the retreats when we went out of town, my observation was that there was great participation, perhaps even uh, slightly better than some of the other retreats. That may have been due to the format. I really want to thank staff for putting that together and our facilitator, whose name escapes me right now, uh, did an absolutely fabulous job of drawing out uh, the question storming. Uh, quite an interesting approach. I think everybody who was there, uh, at least that reached out to me and that I reached out to said that they really enjoyed that. Uh, I think that uh, Director Rex may report on this a little later, uh, but we did host in that room last week, the Metro Area County Commissioner's meeting for the month. And I'll leave, I'll defer to Doug to talk about the substance of that meeting, which was very positive. Uh, the award celebration is next week. In fact, I think it's a week from tonight. And we hope you are all there and all registered, but in case you haven't, we are going to drop a link into the chat for registration. If it's not there already, I'm not gonna bother looking at it right now, uh, but please come out to Empower Field at Mile High. Uh, and at six o'clock is a social hour, seven o'clock, we will start seating. And uh, so again, if you haven't registered, please do. Uh, we'll probably have a report on that from Doug later on the uh, uh, pretty good success we've had <clears throat> in staging our first in-person event in the last two years. We've not only met our goal, but we've exceeded our goal. And Doug, I'll leave it to you to 
uh, to talk about that. Um, the last thing I want to do is um, remark that this will be the last board meeting that we do in this format with our two dimensional faces and uh, the Brady Bunch screen here. We will be back in person and, and we'll have uh, Director Shaw from Performance and Engagement give a report on that. But before I turn it over to that uh, next report, Doug and staff on behalf of the executive committee, and I hope on behalf of the board of directors, I wanna thank our staff for on the fly in March of 2020, when everything started shutting down and we didn't know, would this be two weeks, a month, whatever, we didn't know it would be two years. But I think that Dr. Cog has managed to function smartly, innovatively, and effectively through this entire uh, pandemic. And I just wanna thank Doug and please extend the, the thanks of the board to the entire staff for everything that they did to pull all of this together. Uh, we will be back in person and I don't know that if we'll miss this format or not, but the fact is you guys did a tremendous job for us and thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Director Baker. Um, so with thank that, I want to move to uh, the uh, report from Performance and Engagement Committee and uh, Director Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Performance and Engagement Committee met on April 6th. The committee discussed the annual award celebration. We spoke about the return to in-person board meetings starting in May with p &E and finance and budget meetings to be held before the board meets. For the time being, board workshops may remain virtual. We also provided feedback uh, as we discussed the 2022 board retreat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This concludes my report. Thank you so much, but we're looking forward to this uh, return to in-person. Uh, next up is report on Finance and Budget Committee and Director Baker. Unmute. There it is, unmute. I tried using the space bar and it didn't work this time. So anyway, um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair and directors, we met immediately preceding this meeting uh, this evening at 530. And we had a very jam-packed agenda. We had three items on the consent, four items on the consent agenda, including our minutes. And um, so some of those were ratifying uh, what was done last month, um, allowing the executive director to accept funding, enter into agreements and allocate uh, funds uh, for various things. Uh, um, I'll go into the action items in more detail though. We did approve a resolution authorizing executive director Rex to allocate additional funds of approximately $1 million to the AAA prov uh, service providers for the state fiscal year ending on June 30th, 2022. We approved uh, a resolution authorizing uh, Director Rex to allocate approximately 13.3 million to uh, AAA service providers and extend their contracts for an additional one year period um, ending on June 30th, 2023. We approved another resolution authorizing the uh, Director Rex to accept state funds of approximately $344,000 uh, that are affiliated through uh, Senate Bill 21-290 and to allocate those same funds to service contractors uh, contingent upon the recommendation of the Advisory Committee on Aging. And the last action item we had was a resolution and we authorized the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with Urban Trans to develop a regional TDM strategic plan in an amount not to exceed $200,000. We did have one very, very important informational item. We received the executive, the finance and budget committee received the draft 2022-2023 budget. And so we're in the process of reviewing and um, uh, discussing that. And we will be having a special meeting of the Finance and Budget Committee on May 3rd to um, uh, discuss it further and to make a recommendation to the uh, whole board of directors. That concludes my report. 
Thank you very much, Director Baker. Next up, we have the report of our Executive Director, Doug Rex. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rex, Chairman. Thank you, sir, very much. And first of all, before I begin, I would like to thank you, sir, for, your, for the kind words. Um, and I'll be sure to pass that on to staff. As you know, those, those are truly the people that are making the difference in this community. And I think one thing that we've all recognized, and I'm saying not just Dr. Cog's staff, but all of our communities, how resilient our staffs are in, uh, in being able to muddle through the, the COVID uh, pandemic as it was and, and get, get work done, right? So I'm so, so appreciative of all, of all of our communities and the partnerships that we have. Um, I have a special place, of course, in my heart for our, our AAA staff and making sure during the pandemic that, our, that seniors and older adults didn't go wanting. So, um, and it was, a, it was a monumental task for them to do that. So a special shout out to those folks. So thank you, sir, very much. Um, I will um, just note one thing that you mentioned with regard to the Metro Area County Commissioners. Um, uh, we have uh, agreed with, and, and Mac has, has agreed, we've offered and Mac agreed to uh, allow Dr. Cog to provide some administrative support for, for their group. Um, Commissioner Director Steve Odoricio reached out to me in late uh, 2021 about the idea and concept. And uh, so we'll be providing some general administrative support as well as some coordination amongst the Mac partners, um, kind of being uh, and you know archiving old uh, uh, Mac information, but as well as you know establishing the agendas and and uh, running down speakers if so desired and those types of things. So I, I just want to express the the appreciation I have for the confidence they have in us to 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 be able to do that. So so thank you. Um, the board retreat, Mr. Chairman, as you already mentioned, um, I think we were uh, beyond overjoyed. The, uh, the, the amount of uh, participation we had in that. I wanna thank everybody that, that was able to attend that. I know there were plenty others um, that, that could not because uh, it, you know, when, you know, it was kind of spring break time and, and uh, calendars are set. And I, I certainly understand that. So we will be providing an executive summary um, from our uh, facilitator, Flossie O'Leary, which is the best Irish name ever, next to Kevin Flynn, of course. <laughs> and uh, so we'll, um, uh, we'll be getting that out in here in short order. Um, just another reminder that we still had the board retreat survey out. So if you are a participant, um, I would encourage you to fill that out because we're always looking for your input to improve the event. But I agree with the chair. I, I thought it was based on the conversations I have, it has been well received and, and, um, and hopefully we can use that as a template for, for years to come. On the award celebration, something that's also been mentioned. Um, I listen. Wow, um, we're expecting just a really, really big turnout for this event. We're looking at over 500 participants um, for our April 27th event. Um, so that's that's fantastic. That's just that's just, that's bigger than any event that we've had in the past. And so we're really looking forward to it. Um, and hopefully you've registered. But if not, registration is open for you all for board directors until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, and there's a special registration path uh, to assure uh, it's free of charge for your, you all. And I may ask uh, if uh, Melinda or Steve or someone can put that path in the chat, just so you have that. And, um, and we'll make sure to get you registered up if you haven't already done so. So it's gonna be on April 27th, a week from today at, uh, at Empower Field at mile, mile High and staff's in the process of wrapping up that, our coordination on that and uh, doing table assignments and all that kind of good stuff. So we're excited about the opportunity. Um, reception starts at 6 p.m. next Wednesday, and the actual award celebration starts at 7. So uh, looking forward to seeing you all. The last thing I may mention is the in-person meetings, and it's been mentioned probably a couple of times now um, about what our plan is. Uh, the, myself and the executive committee have been talking about this over the last couple of months, and, and uh, we uh, had a conversation with the Performance and Engagement Committee earlier this month about uh, returning to in-person meetings. And we are planning to return to in-person meetings beginning with our business meeting in May, which is on May 18th, uh, the third Wednesday of the month. So what our plan is, is that the, uh, our board work sessions that are the first Wednesday of will continue to be virtual. Only our business meeting, the third Wednesday of the month will be in-person. Um, and as a result, you may recall, I know performance and engagement committee members know this, that typically you meet after the board work session. 
So what we're planning to do is um, uh, moving the, the P&E meeting to the third Wednesday of the month. So our two committees will meet sequentially. So P&E will go first at uh, 430, I think, and then uh, F&B at Finance and Budget at 530. And then, of course, the board at 630. Um, we've done that in the past when we've had to, and it's worked really well. So this, this um, then, you know, we'll, you know, you only have to come downtown once a month. But we really do feel it's important based on the uh, discussions that the executive committee has had, as well as the forms and engagement committee, that there is value in meeting in per person as a board. Um, and uh, again, it's an opportunity, of course, for you all to get to know each other a little bit better as well on the side. So we, we were looking forward again to, to meeting back in person. The last thing I might mention about that is that we're also setting up a hybrid environment for the public. So right now um, in pre-COVID world, you know, the public, if they want to provide comment, um, had to come in person. So we're planning on setting up a hybrid environment in which a, a member of the public can come and get public comment either in person or virtually. Um, and we will also be streaming our meeting live, um, which is the first time we've done that. You know, we obviously we did it during COVID, but uh, pre-COVID we did not do that. We always had a recording and just put it up on our website after the fact. So we're hoping that that provides a little bit more convenience for, uh, for, for the general public. And uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, that's my report. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for all that information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I, I forgot one more thing, um, and it's okay. related to the in-person meetings. Um, just so you all know, we will be sending out some additional communication on, on return to in-person so that um, you'll have, you know, parking information, um, you know, all that kind of good stuff, too, because we know we have plenty of new members that, uh, that have not, not been here before. Excellent. Is that it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to public comment, I do, I, I've been uh, informed that we do have a new alternate here in attendance, and that is Cheryl Wink of uh, Englewood. Uh, the mayor of Englewood, Mayor Sierra, is here as the director. And so uh, uh, alternate uh, Cheryl Wink is in the attendees. Uh, when, the direct, when the director uh, is present at the meeting, the alternate does not sit at the table. I found out the hard way at my first meeting as an alternate when I walked into the old building and I sat down next to Robin, my uh, director, uh, Councilwoman Kanich, and I was uh, not so politely informed that I had to sit up in the peanut gallery. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, next on the agenda is uh, public comment and we allocate up to 45 minutes for public comment. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. Uh, if there are additional public speakers after that, we allocate time at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. Uh, we do ask, though, that there be no public comment on any issues for which a prior public hearing has been held uh, before the board. I don't know that we're in that uh, time frame right now or not. I don't think we are. Uh, so uh, let me ask uh, Melinda if we have anyone requesting public comment. I do see one in the attendees, Rachel Holton. Can you promote her? Uh, yes, I will give her the ability to speak, uh, ask her to unmute, and she should be able to speak now. Thank you. Welcome, Rachel. Um, Good evening. You have three minutes. Go ahead. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Rachel Haltine, and I'm the Sustainable Transportation Director for Bicycle Colorado. I work with partners across the state to make sure Colorado is a safe and desirable place for everyone to choose active transportation to reach their destination. Together, we share a 2030 vision of a transportation system that's efficient, equitable, and safe for all Coloradans without needing a car. First, I wanna congratulate Dr. Cog on officially ending carbon monoxide maintenance. I was born and raised in Denver during the 1970s, which makes me a brown cloud native. I have many memories of seeing smog obscuring the mountains, of bad asthma days when we'd have to play inside and regular conversations about whether we could light a fire in our fireplace. Decades ago, bold leadership and coordinated action to change behaviors paid off so that kids like me and our future generations would be able to breathe clean air. It took regulating gasoline and restricting wood burning days, mandating emissions, monitoring and testing. None of these mitigations were easy, but they worked. 
It's hard to ignore the similarities between reducing carbon monoxide 50 years ago and reducing car greenhouse gas re greenhouse gas emissions over the next 30 years. In the 1970s, the brown cloud was a novel situation without a proven roadmap to success. Even though we can't look out the window and see greenhouse gas emissions, we are experiencing the devastating impacts of them every day. Lighting a fire is even more dangerous for entirely different reasons. We're forced to stay indoors from smoke particulate than heat index. As the board and Dr. Cog's staff work with CDOT on mitigation strategies and models to identify transportation priorities, it's going to be daunting to reach our greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets. The targets are big and like everything else related to transportation, the impacts of your decision won't be seen or measured for years. But the urgency today couldn't be greater. Transportation investments must prioritize reducing the number of cars on the road. As we enter the math phase and calculate greenhouse gas impacts, I'm asking the board to consider updating the TIP application for calls three and four to require projects to calculate the change in vehicle miles traveled by 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050 for projects. Additionally, we're asking Dr. Cog board to score the change in BMT and the air quality impacts in their own category with their own weighted score, rather than bundling those with the other MetroVision regional transportation priorities. Thank you for working to recalibrate our transportation funding project prioritization and measurements of success. I look forward to seeing you in person at next week's award event. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you for those suggestions. I apologize. I believe I mispronounced your last name, uh, but thank you very much for those suggestions and we will make note of them and, and uh, take them under consideration. Uh, let me ask if there are any other attendees who wish to take advantage of public comment. I don't see any hands raised at the moment. I don't see anybody attending by phone. So I will take it that there are no more public speakers. Thank you, uh, Melinda, you can take the clock down. Uh, the next item is our action item this month, which consists of two uh, items, uh, discussion on state legislative issues. Uh, the first one is bills on which we have previously taken positions. There is no recommendation uh, for action on this unless a member, a director wants to reconsider any of our uh, positions. Uh, so let me ask, uh, we can dispose quickly of a, if, uh, let me ask if any director wishes to discuss previously uh, previously taken positions on any of this legislation. I see none. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's move on to uh, subsection B, new bills for consideration and action. These were sent out uh, a while ago for discussion, and I hope that everybody had a chance to look at them uh, because there are seven of them. And if we need to discuss them, I hope everybody is, uh, is prepared. Uh, Rich Morrow, you are going to lead the discussion on this for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go. And I am ready to, to move on these and then um, get uh, comments and hopefully um, uh, motions from the board. Uh, so the first one, um, maybe I'll cover the first three with the aging bills. Uh, the first one is um, Senate Bill 154. Uh, which is a, a bill that makes a, a, a number of changes to the uh, state's statutes regarding um, assisted living residences, including uh, establishing uh, a first time really ever uh, due process for uh, in what they call involuntary discharges, which are really uh, evictions, um, and providing a process uh, for how that is to occur. Um, the second part of that bill provides for um, kind of updates the requirements for administrators of assisted living um, and uh, establishes a baseline for the qualifications that they need to demonstrate. And the third, third part of that bill um, really updates uh, an outdated uh, cap on, on fines current in current law. Um, the most that the, that the Department of Public Health and Environment could find a facility is a total of $2,000 per year. And uh, this bill in its current form would um, 
increase that to up to potentially up to fifteen thousand dollars per fi uh, violation, um, with the opportunity or the option for the department to exceed that uh, in eg egregious cases, um, and um, that's pretty much in line with what other states do. Um, and that bill is uh, has made it through the House, or I'm sorry, the Senate. Health and Human Services Committee and the Appropriations Committee and is scheduled for consideration on the floor of the Senate, um, possibly tomorrow, maybe not till Monday. Um, the next bill is uh, Senate Bill 185, I believe, yeah. Um, and that bill is sort of a companion bill in some ways to uh, House Bill 1035, which, um, has already been signed by the governor that is the modernization of the older Coloradans Act, um, but it's, it's more even more directly related to Senate Bill 290 from last year, which was the Area Agency on Aging Grant Fund that allocated $15 million uh, for grants to um, area agencies on aging. And I think Dr. Cog um, or uh, AAA has reported to finance and budget and, and, and maybe to the board as well about the grants that we've received from that. Um, that was a, a one-time only fund and appropriation, and this bill makes that fund permanent, but expands it to uh, infrastructure investments and innovation, innovative investments uh, in, in uh, aging. So beyond uh, uh, more, it, it still focuses on AAAs, but it's more than AAAs and um, would make that permanent. The only problem with the bill is there's no money uh, associated with it, so um, uh, that will be our big uh, our big challenge for next year is to actually get money into that fund. Um, but we're we're recommending support for that bill as well. And then the final bill uh, for aging is Senate Bill One Eighty Nine, um, uh, and this is a bill that uh, that we would like to support uh, because it would. Uh, um, really begin an effort, and it's part of an effort actually started last year with Senate Bill 158 that uh, was a, a loan repayment program for, um, I think it was physician's assistants and uh, nurses and maybe a couple of other professions to, that, to get a specialty in geriatric care. Um, it, it, the, the specialties in geriatric care are really lacking in Colorado and particularly as our um, aging population is growing fastly. Um, there's a lot of interest in, in finding ways to increase uh, the understanding of, of care for older adults. This bill would, would sort of build on that by um, helping to fund uh, programs um, initially with uh, uh, University of Colorado at Anschutz Center and, and it could also expand to other universities uh, to train uh, professionals in geriatric care that then could also go out to the state and train others. Uh, and so we would like to support that bill as well. So uh, Mr. Chair, do you want me to see if there's questions on that or uh, yes. for the aging and then we'll move on after that? Yes, exactly. I was just texting Doug that that was my plan. And I couldn't <laughs> find my unmute button. We're on the <laughs> so thank you. Yes, let's, uh, because of the uh, relations, the relationship of, uh, among these three bills, let's uh, entertain discussion now on them and, and take a vote on them. If we can do them in a block, fine. If we need to do them separately, we can do That's that. Fine. That makes sense, Rich. Thank you. I have first uh, Director Harrison uh, with his hand up. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so my question is, A, number one, um, uh, full disclosure, I have an uncle who has grown up in uh, Denver metro area since 1951, um, and he is uh, mentally disabled as well as physically disabled. Lived in group home, the Jewish Family Group Services home for about 38 years up until COVID hit, um, and they were to close down even before uh, the pandemic started because of financing for their group home and the state funding that was available uh, to help them continue. And it's been my understanding that a lot of that funding for those kind of group homes um, and host homes has, is, has not kept 
pace competitively with the rest of the nation in terms of other states. Provide more clarity in regard to that as far as what this bill, the funding bill portion of it would help if we can get that off the ground or what is our floor in terms of the amount of money that we do give for funding for folks with disabilities to, to, to live um, when they cannot work for themselves. Do we have any information on that? I might have to call for help on that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. We have uh, Ed and Jennifer in the in the attendees. Would they be able to help on that? Um, uh, I mean, I think if the question is about what Dr. Cog already does, then it's probably Jayla or Doug. I, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Uh, particularly because if you're if you're referring to um, you know in the in the uh, disability or IDD area, I mean we do some of that. It's uh, but uh, I'm quickly getting out of my <laughs> expertise on that. No, I, I get it. Okay, if if there is an answer that Ed or Jennifer can give on the legislation itself, and then we have Jayla here also. Uh, does anybody want to tackle that? Um, I, I have not. This is Ed Bowditch. I have nothing to add to Rich's answer. Jayla's okay. got her hand up. So, yes. okay, uh, Jayla, can you address that? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so this bill applies to assisted living and nursing homes, which are not the same as uh, the group homes that you all are talking about. You're absolutely right. We haven't kept pace. Uh, there needs to be an effort for those. The ombudsman doesn't cover um, group homes. So uh, that's why, um, it, it, actually, that's part of why you don't see as much advocacy for those is because we, we advocate hard for folks in assisted living and, and nursing homes. So uh, sorry, this doesn't, this doesn't really apply to those. So is, uh, to that unless, point. unless your cousin lives in a, 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 a uh, an assisted living. Well, no, he, he, my uncle does not. My uncle, sorry. Um, but that's okay. Um, but I think that even so, um, you know, conditions change on the ground. Obviously, he's been able to stay in a group home kind of scenario. Um, but there is a time where he may have to go to assisted living. Right. Uh, but, there, but there are thousands of residents like that in the state. Um, and so I think from, I, I don't know what, from a Dr. Cog perspective we can do, but it would certainly be, be helpful to give voice to that that's outside of the assisted living area because those group homes are drying up rather quickly. And what happens is uh, in, the, in this specific case, um, when the pandemic hit, for instance, there was seven or eight residents in just that group home alone. Um, when they, they closed it down immediately when everything else closed, yeah. And residents had to now find yep. where to live because they couldn't live there. And yeah. Some were able to get family members. So I think that's, yeah, that's top of mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we saw so much of that. Um, we also saw some assisted livings um, stop admissions. We saw assisted livings make uh, involuntary discharges, ev ev evictions um, to accommodate. Uh, COVID units, which they got higher reimbursement for. So I think it's important, this bill, mm -hmm. um, to protect those residents. But, uh, but I hear you, and we, we yeah. will definitely add our voices to those that are advocating for group homes. I appreciate you, Jayla, and I'm glad that we were able to, for those folks, maybe not top of mind, they, they can understand it better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jayla. Uh, Director Shaw, go ahead. Thank you. And I uh, would like to say that I appreciate the summary that Rich gave. Um, it really highlights, one, that we are a rapidly aging state, uh, Douglas County in particular in the metro area is the most rapidly aging county. So um, um, bills like these not only help the AAAs, but help the individuals that the AAA serves. And for these reasons, um, I also attend the Advisory Committee on Aging, the ACA, and um, 
they've seen these bills and are in support of them, uh, I move we support them as the staff recommendation. Okay, that is your motion? Uh, yes. Okay, that we support one Senate bills 154, 185, and 189 in a block. Uh, yes. Do we have a second to that? Uh, Director Hudson. I may have just gotten my answer. Um, oh. uh, I just asked about, I, I work in the House and not the Senate, so I've not read these three particular bills. I'm, I'm just concerned there's not a fiscal note to them. Um, that usually means you're going to get less money than you actually need um, for the funding of them. And I always hate to see something passed that's not fully funded. Usually you get a poor outcome. Uh, and at a time when the, the House literally has money overflowing the top of the Golden Dome, um, I would hate to see three really good bills not be fully funded um, for at least five years. Uh, so they have a chance to grow and, and, and actually have a foothold in the state. And it, it disappoints me to not see a, a fiscal note attached to them. Um, well, um, I thought, Director Hudson, I think that um, actually I could answer that a little bit. Um, and I, and I think I just that. got part, part of that answer. I think I just got from Doug. Because <laughs> um, I think it's been updated, correct? Yeah, there it, should it be. has Director Hudson. Yes, um, Rich. I, I don't know if you know the specifics, but I what I'm seeing is it's 1.176 million. That's in, for uh, uh, fiscal year. Yeah. Yes, for 189. Yes, that's for 189. So yeah. that has a fiscal note. And what yeah, about the other it, two? it does now. Yeah. Yeah, the other two. That was the only one that didn't. That was the only one that didn't. Uh, and okay. I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. Yeah, the fiscal note came out after the uh, agenda came out or went out gotcha. uh, 154. Um, that one is like $100,000 uh, for the department's uh, costs of doing like rulemaking and so forth. And um, that was already approved. The funding for that was already approved in Senate appropriations. Okay. Um, and 185 really doesn't have a fiscal note at this point because there's, um, it's just a, it's just a, a placeholder really. It, they cre it creates the grant fund. Okay. And then now we got to look for money for it. The real issue is on 189, and and Doug's right. It was what'd you say 1.17? 1. 176. Yeah, and okay. um, that's a good start. That's the okay. only one. Uh, it passed out a committee this week and hasn't had its hearing in Senate appropriations yet. Uh, and so that'll be the next test to to make sure that it can get the funding that it that it requires. I got my answer at the same time I got asked. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I saw Director Smith had her hand raised. I think that might have been to second uh, Director Shaw's motion. Is that correct? Correct. I'd like to second the motion. Thank you so much, Director Smith. Is there any other discussion on the motion to support uh, these three Senate bills, 154, 185, and 189? Okay. Uh, we need to do some quick mathematics. Uh, Doug and Melinda, are you prepared to uh, to do that? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, if there are directors who whose uh, practice requires them to abstain, uh, I would ask that we raise our hands so that we can count them and uh, take that into uh, deduct that from the denominator. And uh, Denver is one of those because we have not taken a position on these three bills. So let, let's everybody who needs to abstain, please raise your hand and keep them up so that uh, Melinda can count them. I see nine right now. I see 10, 11. We'll give it another uh, five seconds. Thank you. I see 11 abstentions. Uh, we'll do some quick math. Take your hands down. There were 36 directors present. Uh, so with deducting 11, uh, what do we, what's the vote count required to support the staff recommendation? 16, thank you. Well, my, my phone is telling me, thank you, Melinda. Uh, so we need 16 yes votes in order for the board to take a position of support these three bills. So let me put this to the vote. All those in favor of uh, supporting these three Senate bills, uh, please raise your hands, your hand. Wow.
Thank you, Melinda. Can you count them? I see 21. I see the same thing. Thank you. Uh, if everybody would take down their hands, let me ask if there are any uh, directors who are opposed to a position of support on these three bills. Please raise your hand if you are uh, opposed to supporting these bills. I see none. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on, uh, Rich, to the next uh, the next bill on your list. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have three transportation bills. And um, beginning with uh, Senate Bill 175, and that one actually has uh, passed the Senate and is uh, moved over to the House, and so it will start its journey th through the House. Um, and you may have heard about this, but this is one that um, uh, I guess updates or expands the laws regarding um, the use of uh, uh, cell phones, really, I think. Uh, in cars, and um, uh, staff is recommending support for this based on uh, um, the uh, board policies and, and programs that we've been implementing around um, uh, traffic and safety and our regional Vision Zero action plan and so forth. Um, and uh, so that one has, has moved along and um, I'll, I'll move on, I'll, I'll describe all three of these again, and then we'll kind of do the same thing we did with, uh, tr with the aging bills, see if there's- but Actually, uh, actually, can we, uh, uh, can we pause that? here because I have a hand raised. Director okay. Kraft, yeah, we can do that. Can I ask a question now, or do you want me to wait? Let's go because different topics. I'd rather, uh, Rich, if it's okay, I'd rather take one at a time. Thank so you. Rich, one, Rich, one of the problems with this bill in the past has been that it didn't cover apps. So uh, does this cover the use of apps like Ooh. Google Maps or if you're an Uber driver? So does it, does it cover that? You know what? I'm not sure I can answer that question. Well, I thank you very much for your honesty, sir. <laughs> uh, so, so this has been why as a legislator, I have voted no on this bill love the you know believe in the concept let's get stop distracted drivers but the world is more than just using your phone as your phone right thank you i see uh, uh ron papsdorf has a stand i was just going to ask if ron had a comment <laughs> yes please ron go ahead we need to unmute you I muted Ron, him Ron, you so muted. he couldn't speak. <laughs> and I'm still muted. Thank you. There you go. Can't wait now that. we can hear you. Won't have to say that anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, Director Kraft, Tharp, uh, in reading the bill uh, as originally introduced and as it passed out of the Senate and it there was slightly amended in the Senate, I think they've dealt with that issue um, in this legislation by basically prohibiting the use of a mobile device in your hand. Um, and so as long as you're using a mobile device in a hands-free mode, then, you know, you can have it mounted on your dashboard or connected to your car's um, uh, electronic system in order to use those apps. But if you're, if you're holding the mobile device, that's where the infraction occurs. And I, and I, I will just, since I have the floor, Mr. Chair, if you'll indulge me, I will just, for the, for the board's benefit, just remind you all that um, you know, the board adopted the region's Vision Zero plan uh, back in June of 2020. Um, and um, I'll remind you that um, the kind of five year crash history uh, in this region leading, uh, that we used in that, in that Vision Zero plan, um, uh, there were between 2013 and 2017, those five years, um, 1,149 individuals died on our transportation system in crashes in those five years. Um, another over 8,800 were seriously injured in crashes on our transportation system. And um, those folks were disproportionately represented by bicyclists and pedestrians, the most vulnerable of our users, which I think is what compelled the board to adopt our Vision Zero strategy. And I wish I could say that things have gotten better since then, but they have not. 
And I, you know, we have found that distracted driving is a really significant contributor um, to two crashes on a transportation system and those deaths and serious injuries. And so that's why we're recommending uh, that we support this bill. Great, thank you. Uh, Director Binkley, go ahead. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, I just had a question. I just had some questions. Um, and maybe if somebody just said that we've been thinking about this for a long time, but was there data between whoever was just talking had stated at the amount of deaths data on like how many of that was from phones or other things. And I guess my follow-up question would be, are we gonna ban all of the other things that are causing those issues? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Director Binkley, yes, this is Ron Kapsdorf again yes, go ahead. Uh, with staff. Um, it's, it's a little tough um, on the data side. Um, those uh, first responders and police officers that write the crash reports, um, you know, there, there can be many contributing factors. There is good research that indicates that distracted driving is a contributor to, to crashes. Um, this is not a be all and end all. It's not a solution to our fatalities and serious injuries. It's, it's one, one action uh, to consider. Uh, taking to to help save people's lives. Oh yeah, thank you. I just the last data that I read was talking about how phones were actually not the highest contributed to distracted driving. So that's why I was that's why I was wondering about that. But yeah, I agree. It needs to be thought about. Thank you, uh, Director Levy. You're up. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I, I hope that we will take a, um, a position of support for this. Uh, I sponsored, I think, the first legislation that, um, that prohibited the use of a cell phone um, while driving. And while I had hoped that it would be as sweeping as this, I wasn't able to get that done. And so it was limited to uh, new drivers as the total ban and then just a prohibition on texting. And in the course of working on that bill for several years, I did get uh, a lot of data, a lot of research on the problem of distracted driving. And there is good research that, um, that trying to um, use a cell phone um, particularly when you're holding it in your hand or it requires a kind of divided attention that makes it very dangerous to drive. Um, I, I should say also that the research I found at the time indicated that hands-free is um, safer, but still does present a problem because mm -hmm. of divided attention. But it seemed that on balance, um, hands-free was better than using, than holding a phone or a mobile device. And, um, and that, that, that would create some, you know, improved safety uh, quite a bit. So I, I, think it's, um, I think it's time. There were concerns about, um, about um, uh, um, you know, targeting um, people of color um, and th those were concerns I noticed this bill says that the officer must see a person, actually see them using their phone, which should help with that. And then we've made a lot of progress on, um, uh, on um, implicit bias and disproportionate impacts on traffic stops through other means since then. So I think it's a good bill and I hope we'll support it. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, Director Shahrazai. And please correct me if I mispronounced your name. Uh, thank you, Director Fun. I would say uh, you're the closest that we've ever come in this group, so I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I appreciate uh, Director Levy's comments just now, and we did discuss this uh, in uh, the legislative convening in the city of Lakewood, and for the reasons of sort of the nebulous um, impact that this could potentially have on folks um, of color and, and maybe the misuse of this law, we made a decision not to support this bill. We found it to be um, challenging to be able to enforce and a little bit of concern that this could be used as a tool to pull folks over um, maybe under false pretenses. So for that reason, I won't be supporting this bill tonight. 
Thank you very much for raising that point. Are there any other comments? If not, I would like to, uh, as I said before, I'd like to do these one at a time, uh, obviously, since we're going to have a no vote, uh, at least one. Uh, so let me entertain a motion to, uh, let's frame it in, the, in, the, in terms of motion to support the staff position. Uh, would anyone like to make that motion? Uh, Director Starker, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to support Senate Bill 175. Thank you, Director Levy. Uh, I will second that motion, thank you. Thank you very much. Are, is there any other discussion to be had? If not, uh, if there are directors who need to abstain on this, please raise your hand so we can redo our math. And I understand Director Teal has joined us now also. So the, 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 we now, I believe, have 37 directors here. I see nine. Thank you. Melinda, can you do the math for us? Doing it currently, so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. I have a feeling when we go back to in-person meetings, we'll wish we had a mute button instead of an unmute mm -hmm. button. Nineteen. Thank you, Melinda, very much. Okay, we'll take 19 uh, votes in favor to pass this motion to support. So let me ask uh, for the vote now, all in favor of uh, Dr. Cog taking a position, position of support on Senate Bill 175, please raise your hands. Wow, I see 19, is that correct? Now, now I see 18. Did someone just drop out on purpose? Let me give it five more seconds. If you are in favor of 175, please raise your hand. Thank you, I see exactly 19. Melinda, is that correct? I see that as well. All right. Let me ask now everybody to lower their hand. And if you uh, want to vote no on this motion, please raise your hands. I see four. I see five. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right, let's close the voting and, and call that 19 to five. And I believe, Melinda, that means that we have taken a position of support. Thank you. That's correct. All right, uh, Rich, on to the next one. The next one, uh, Senate Bill 176, is uh, basically some funding for the uh, early work on the uh, Front Range Passenger Rail, uh, as described in the, in the uh, matrix there. And um, that bill also has moved over to the House, so it's passed through the Senate as well. And um, staff's recommending a, a support position on that. Um, if you wanna wait and, and then have comments or questions. Um, again, if you have questions, I'll ask Ron to answer them <laughs> or Doug. <laughs> um, okay. uh, but the staff recommendation is to support that bill. All right, uh, comments or questions from members? on Senate Bill 176. Would anyone like to uh, put on the floor a motion to uh, support the staff position of supporting this bill? Uh, Director Peck. Thank you. I move to support SB 176. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Director Starker. I will second the motion. Thank you very much. We have a motion on the floor. Let me ask if there are questions or discussion uh, Director Peck, your hand is up. Do you wish to uh, make comments? No, okay. Uh, I see no one wishing to make comments or have questions. All right, well, let me ask if there are directors who need to abstain on this uh, motion, please raise your hands. Let's give it five more seconds, Melinda. If you need to abstain, please raise your hand.
All right, let's close that out. I see six. And we'll do, uh, well, now I see five. Okay, six. Sorry, I thought you were done. Thank you. I am done now. Everybody rate, uh, lower your hands, there are six. I apologize, Director Kraftler. Uh, we will do some quick math. Twenty-one. Thank you, Melinda. So we need twenty-one yes votes in order to take a position of supporting this uh, this bill. So all in favor of supporting Senate Bill One Seventy Six, please raise your hand. Hmm. Okay. I, I count 25. Is that your count, Melinda? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, everyone. 25 in support. Uh, let's go, uh, let's lower our hands. And if anybody needs to take a position of opposing uh, Senate Bill 176, please raise your hands. Okay, I see two. Going once, going twice, going three times. All right, 25 to two. Uh, is that your final count, uh, Melinda? Uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you. So that motion passes and Dr. Cog board supports 176. Next we have 180. Thank you. Uh, Rich, go ahead. Uh, Senate Bill 180 also has moved over to the Senate. And uh, I'm sorry, to the House. Um, and it will go through the process again there. Uh, and this bill creates a grant program in the uh, Colorado Energy Office to provide funding um, for transit associations to provide free transit services during uh, ozone season. And um, it also creates a, a transit services pilot project within CDOT um, and it helps fund uh, that uh, um, free those free transit services in uh, uh, this coming budget year 22-23 and in the next year 23-24 um, and uh, particularly for the uh, air quality benefits I believe as well as uh, the other transportation benefits. The uh, staff is recommending support on that one as well. And so again, if there's any questions, I'll do my best to answer, ask them, answer them, but I might also ask for help too. <laughs> Excellent. All right, uh, discussion on uh, the proposed motion to support Senate Bill 180. Director Shaw, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I guess my question is, one, do we know how RTD feels about this, if they could um, do something like this? And two, um, it says that this money would fund, uh, what was it, up to 80% of their fare box revenue. And, I, you know, I don't know if they could come up with the other 20%, it seems um, challenging for, for this bill to order them to do something that they don't have the money to support. Understanding that correctly? Uh, Executive Director Rex, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Shaw and Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe that this, this the bill language in here was was negotiated with RTD, so they're aware of the of of the um, you know, the funding formula included. Thank you. All right. Do we have other questions or comments on Senate Bill One Hundred and Eighty? Director Peck, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, we discussed this at the MCC meeting and decided that we would support it and that RTD. Ha, is aware of this and uh, has stated that they do, they will be able to provide this service. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Director Levy, you had your hand up and then down. Uh, was that the same comment? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, any other comments or questions? Director Harrison, please go ahead. So, yeah, quick question in regard to that. Did they talk about um, whether or not it was any route specific, for instance, funding for those routes that may not be, that they, they will be covered for those routes that are not used as much? Say up here in Erie, we do use it, but obviously the number of people that use RTD is much more in the metro area, down Denver area. Um, was there any discussion about whether they would use that money to cover the cost down there more than up uh, in sparsely located areas where RTD is? I don't remember specific convert or hearing specific conversations about that. Mr. Yes, Chairman. Yeah, Executive that. Director Rex, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the question, Director. Yeah, it, so my understanding is that the, the free transit on, during the month of the free transit would be offered all throughout the region mm -hmm. for their existing service at the time of that free transit, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so the whole region. Okay, thank you. Correct, yes. Excellent, thank you. Uh, other questions? Seeing none, I'd like to, I'm sorry, uh, Director Starker, go ahead. I was going to make a motion to support Senate Bill 180. Thank you, a motion, anyone want to second that? Director Shaw. I second that motion, thank you. Thank you very much. We have a mo motion and a second that the board take a position of support for Senate Bill 180. If there are uh, members, if there are directors who need to abstain, please raise your hand and keep them up until we can count them. If you need to abstain. I will give it five more seconds. Thank you, I see seven. Uh, Melinda, can you do the math for us on this? I hope you have a calculator too, by the way. 20. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, feels very back channel here, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, 20 required to pass. So everybody take, please lower your hands and let me ask all those in favor of uh, the motion to support the Senate Bill 180, please raise your hands. Give it five more seconds. Thank you. I see 23. Now I see 22. Did someone take it down just because I, I said 23? I, I apologize. I oh, thought you had finished. Thank you. I just I was waiting for Melinda to verify that she saw what I saw. Yes. So this sorry. This will all change. <laughs> when we're in person, this will all be different. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, please lower your hands, everybody. 23 is sufficient to take a position of support, but I do want to record, record if there are any votes against. So if you are opposed to uh, uh, supporting Senate Bill 180, please raise your hand. I see none, I see one, two, give it uh, five more seconds. If you are opposed to the motion. Thank you, I see two. All right, so uh, the motion does pass. Thank you very much. I believe we have one more Yes. Uh, from Rich. Yep, the last one, uh, Mr. Chair, is in members is uh, a housing related bill, one that I, I would think that most of you have heard about at least through other associations. Um, this bill, House Bill 1304, is one of the package of bills that came out of the Affordable Housing Transformational Task Force that met last year to determine allocation of funds of the uh, ARPA, federal ARPA funds. And this bill, I'm trying to remember the exact number without going back to the fiscal note, I think it's somewhere around $180 million uh, for uh, grants to local governments and nonprofits, uh, which as you can see is the reason why decided to focus on this one and put it on 
um, your list of support um, in uh, uh, in the in the in the pa recent past weeks after uh, the bill or while the bill was being debated or, or discussed before it was introduced and since then um, I had a uh, opportunity to work with the uh, sponsors and staff to um, include some additional language in that bill clarifying that councils of governments and regional planning commissions can be uh, part of the definition of local governments so that uh, they could be eligible recipients of funds and be able to partner with other local governments on, on these affordable housing projects. Uh, and also some language uh, making it clear that eligible expenditures or, or projects could include senior housing and uh, remodeling and other uh, uh, construction and efforts and so forth that, that uh, provide for, um, let's say, uh, disability access and senior friendly uh, development. And um, so it was nice to be able to, to get some good responsiveness uh, from the sponsors to include that kind of language in this bill. Uh, so with that, I'd uh, recommend uh, that uh, the board support this bill. Thank you very much, uh, Rich. Uh, first up, I have Director Baker. Go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I had in my notes uh, that CCI uh, supports this bill. Does, does anyone else uh, from a county commissioner's standpoint uh, ha have that same information that <clears throat> CCI is supporting it? Is there any director who has information on that? County commissioner director. If not, then I think my notes are, are from staff. Um, tell me. <clears throat> that... That's my recollection as well. Okay. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. And I know <clears throat> maybe Ed and Jennifer might know it as well. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, Director Walton. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, director, I'm not hearing you. I... Okay, how about now? That's that's it. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, I uh, absolutely support this bill, um, and would like to see Dr. Cog take a position of support as the staff recommends. Um, I had a question on whether or not um, eligibility for this grant program would include. Uh, local communities um, uh, or regions um, pulling money together for land banking for affordable housing projects. I'm trying to remember if land, land banking is specifically mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. My recollection of, of reading through the bill, and it has been a few days, actually a couple of weeks probably, um, it does include um, um, land acquisition. So I don't know if it if it's the same thing specifically as land banking, um, uh, but we could find out <laughs> specifically. But I do remember the terminology land land acquisition being in the bill. Um, Rich, this is Ed. Yeah. Um, ahead, just Ed. looking at the language of the bill, it does include a reference to land banking. Great, excellent. Thank you, Great. Director Walton. Thank Walton's you so much. Thank Great. you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Spear, you are up. Thank you. Um, and I don't have a question, just a comment. Um, I think this is wonderful. It was especially exciting to see uh, coming out of our board retreat um, where we were really talking about housing and seeing some of those come together, especially with the focus on transit-oriented development, um, just, just feels like it's really uh, aligned. So Boulder is supporting this um, and I hope that Dr. Cog will as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Levy, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to just call everybody's attention to the portion of the bill that deal that uh, creates the strong communities grant program. Um, also, uh, really apropos because of the discussion we had at the retreat, but something I think we've been trying to do, I think, at Dr. Cog for a while uh, to meet some of the um, Metro Vision metrics that we're having trouble meeting, which we might be talking about later. And, and what the Strong Communities Grant Program does is 
provide funding uh, for um, to support infill development, to support housing uh, co-located with transit, to support mixed use development, all kinds of good land use practices that um, uh, that would really help both facilitate affordability um, because people would be less dependent on single occupancy vehicles, but also would help us meet our uh, greenhouse gas reduction rules. So I think that that's another great benefit of the bill. And my understanding was that it was amended to increase. Uh, originally, it had uh, $28 million for the Strong Communities Grant Program. And I think that was increased to 40 million. So, uh, so that's another benefit of this bill. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, are there any other questions or comments on House Bill 1304? Is there any discussion on whether Dr. Cog should support? Uh, Director Walton, please go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we take a position of support on Bill HB 1304. Thank you very much. Is there a second, uh, Director Maurer? Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second that we take a position of support uh, on uh, House Bill 1304, if there is, if there are directors who need to abstain on this, uh, please raise your hands so that we can take account. Let me give it another five seconds. I see only three at the moment. All right, uh, I have three who need to abstain. Uh, Lower your hands, please. And let me call for the vote. All those in favor of the motion to support House Bill 1304, please raise your hands. Oh, I'm sorry, Melinda, 23 to pass. Sorry about that. And I see 29 hands raised. Uh, which means that uh, the motion will pass, but let me ask everyone to lower your hands. And if you need to, uh, if you want to vote no on this motion, please raise your hand now. All right, I see two hands raised voting no. So uh, motion passes 29 to two. Thank you very much, everyone. Is that, I think that's the last bill there, uh, Rich, is that yes, is. correct? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. I need to make a correction. Uh, I scrolled too fast with my little mouse wheel here. Another thing that will not happen anymore in person mm -hmm. after we did the uh, public comment and it scrolled me right past the consent agenda uh, item. Uh, so I'd like to go back to item seven and ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda, which consists uh, only of the minutes of March 16th meeting. Director Starker. I move to approve the consent agenda items. Thank you. Uh, Director Harrison. A second. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? I certainly hope not. Uh, all in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the minutes of the last meeting, please unmute and say aye. 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 Is there, is there anybody opposed, God forbid? No, okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me correct my error. I blame it uh, not only on the mouse wheel, but not having left the city and county building before the 9-11, or the 9-11, uh, the 420, <laughs> the 420 uh, party started. Uh, informational briefings, item nine, the end of carbon monoxide maintenance. We had a comment on this from our public commenter in the beginning of the meeting, but uh, this is something we're all gonna be very interested in. Uh, Robert Spots is going to give us the presentation. Is that correct? Uh, thank you. Uh, Rick Coffin from the Air Pollution Control Division will give us the presentation. I'm just here to introduce him. Um, okay. Just a brief, <laughs> brief introduction that uh, in January, the Denver region completed its 20 year maintenance period, uh, which means we have not had a violation of federal carbon monoxide um, uh, standards for oh, well over 20 years. Um, that ends our transportation conformity reporting requirements and is generally just a great accomplishment in terms of um, an air quality success story. And with that, I'll hand it over to Rick Coffin from the Air Pollution Control Division of the Colorado Department of Health. who will uh, give you more details and talk about the next steps in that process. 
Thank you, Robert. Uh, Rick, go ahead, please. And you can take over the screen, I hope. Yes, hey there. Can you hear me and see the screen? I do, and I can hear you as well. Go ahead. Great. Thanks for the intro, Robert. And uh, I'm Rick Coffin, a planner with the Air Pollution Control Division at CDPHG. And as Robert uh, mentioned, I will be presenting on the Denver Metro and Longmont carbon monoxide maintenance areas and our uh, effort to request a redesignation to full attainment from EPA. So I'll talk about um, some background information about carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide standard by EPA, um, plans that we developed um, with Dr. Cog's help and leadership uh, to attain the standard and maintain it over 20 years. And then um, I'll end with our redesignation re request. Just a little refresher on carbon monoxide, uh, also called CO, and um, not to be confused with carbon dioxide, CO2, which is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas that can be harmful when inhaled in large amounts. Um, it's pretty uncommon uh, for high levels to um, come about outdoors, but when they do occur, they can be um, of particular concern for people with heart disease, uh, pregnant women, children, uh, and the elderly. And uh, lately, <clears throat> carbon monoxide has been uh, known as more of a concern for indoors due to gas leaks, um, you know, issues with appliances, um, not necessarily an outdoor issue anymore, which is uh, great for us. And mobile sources are the main contributors to CO2 emissions in the U.S., uh, including in the front range regions. So recognizing that carbon monoxide was an um, issue uh, for public health. The EPA um, set standards for it in 1971. And basically, there's a one-hour standard and an eight-hour standard. And if those levels are um, exceeded at a monitor, the area does not um, uh, comply with the standard. And periodically, EPA reviews all the air quality standards um, and see should they be retained, uh, made more stringent, less stringent. And uh, as you can see here, over the years, the standard has remained at the same level as supported by research. So in the 70s, we, we as in many other parts of the country, had um, a carbon monoxide problem due to motor vehicle exhaust. Hundreds of exceedances, um, as you can see, you know, and as the public comment referenced, um, the brown cloud uh, over Denver, <clears throat> and and, uh, and due to that, EPA designated the area as non-attainment um, under the Clean Air Act um, amendments of 1977. So, I think you all know this, but if an area is not um, in compliance with an air quality standard then uh, they're technically in non-attainment. Um, and that's where the non-attainment area um, label comes from. Here are some other photos from the Denver Post, pretty striking images. And this is a map of the Denver Metro CO area and a close up of the Longmont CO area. And uh, we're actually re remodeling our offices right now. And I've been going through lots of old documents and I came across this old uh, uh, plan from 1978 that actually Dr. Cog was the lead on. Um, and they focused uh, um, on transportation, stationary sources, land use, um, yeah, uh, control measures, uh, inventories, and putting a plan to um, move toward attaining the standards. So uh, you've been at this hard work for a long time um, and it, it continues for other pollutants, but I just wanted to highlight that here. But thankfully in the 80s, um, really uh, thanks to different control measures and federal tailpipe standards, 
uh, and fleet turn turnover as the older, dirtier vehicles um, were leaving the fleet, uh, CO levels greatly decreased. And <clears throat> the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission, which is uh, a body that adopts uh, air quality regulations in the state, um, we they also uh, adopted some rules to address air quality issues in the state, including um, the, the nation's first oxy oxygenated gasoline um, state standard to reduce CO emissions, which basically um, that gasoline burns more efficiently. Uh, and then also wood burning stove controls. So the, the state SIP was adopted, um, state implement, sorry for the acronym, <laughs> implementation plan SIP was adopted by the commission in 82 and revised versions were adopted over the years as well. And um, Dr. Cog contributed to, to those plans um, over the years and you know, has continued to do so over the years. So just wanna recognize that. And uh, due to all this, the frequency of exceedances decreased greatly throughout the 80s and um, by the early 90s, but we, didn't have enough reductions fast enough, and we were still classified as a moder moderate CO non-attainment area by the EPA in, um, in 1990. This is a uh, an ad that I found as I was cleaning out <laughs> um, uh, the office as well, and um, it's actually from 1986, so levels were going down, but uh, down there, I don't know if I could zoom in here. Um, but basically, uh, it's a campaign to try to get the public to, you know, not drive on high pollution days. Um, there was actually a voluntary um, measure for people to not drive on certain days, depending on the first two digits of your license plate, which is that table down there, um, which is a uh, pretty interesting forward thinking idea. Okay. So thanks to all this hard work and the federal um, tailpipe standards, the Longmont area has not experienced a violation since 1988, Denver since 1995, and that was actually the last violation in the entire state. So once an area uh, is in attainment with standards, they can request to be designated as a maintenance slash attainment area by the EPA. And, um, Basically, in order to do that, they have to have a plan in place that is approved by the EPA. They have to show that the measures that are put in place are permanent. Um, the area has to be in compliance with all the Clean Air Act requirements, and a maintenance plan has to be um, submitted and approved by the EPA. So uh, we worked on that along with uh, Dr. Cog and um, partners at the RAC, and as you can see by this uh, table up here, um, it took a number of years to develop, submit to the EPA, then to have EPA's approval. And then that effective date of the first plan in 2002 and 1999 for Longmont, if you go, if you count from that column to the last column, that's 20 years. So basically transportation conformity um, which is uh, in this area, basically led by Dr. Cog, um, applies through those dates. And the maintenance plan included um, emissions inventory, um, monitoring network, uh, information so that we can monitor and um, confirm that we are attaining the standard and control measures. Um, I talked about the wood burning control program and that last bullet is uh, permitting requirements for industrial sources. And this is a, um, a chart of the CO levels in, at our monitoring locations in, in the area. And as you can see, the levels greatly um, decreased uh, over the last few decades and they've been uh, very low. Um, there were some slight increases, um, but almost insignificant, like a point a digit. <clears throat> so 
So <clears throat> as far as redesignation to attainment, so basically after 20 years of continued maintenance, an area can request to um, be redesignated by the EPI as a maintenance area to a complete attainment area. And um, until the area does that and EPA approves a revised um, plan that's submitted by the state, everything in the maintenance plan has to be um, complied with un until EPA takes action on a redesignation request. So that's what we're working on now. Um, the only requirement that no longer um, applies after 20 years is transportation and general conformity. Um, so that's no longer required by Dr. Cog, um, at least for this pollutant. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a 110L demonstration that basically shows that if we uh, sunset this maintenance plan, that the area isn't going to slip back into non-attainment for CO. And um, we're very confident uh, uh, that that will not happen. So our next steps is our commission, um, and, and this is a ten tentative uh, schedule, but uh, we think that the commission will um, consider for adoption the redesignation request. Uh, it will be sent to the legislature uh, next spring and then in, next summer submitted to the EPA and uh, it will likely take the EPA maybe a year and a half, two years to take action on this. Thank you. But um, I just wanted to say, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me tonight. And uh, thanks again for Dr. Cog's hard work um, with all your transportation planning. Um, you're usually the experts in the room when it comes to this stuff. So really appreciate it and um, appreciate working with Ron and Robert and um, Steve Cook. Um, so yeah, please let me know if you have any questions. Or... Sure, thank you, Rick. Uh, a lot of people worked on this and it's amazing when you talk about a 20 year period and actually it's been longer than 20 years for a lot of us uh, that a lot of different people have worked on this through that time period. Uh, Rick, I don't suppose that you were here for all those 20 years uh, you're just here at the end of it. A lot of effort and a lot of a, a lot of uh, credit also, I think, goes to uh, nationally uh, because vehicles themselves have become a lot cleaner uh, over those decades. Uh, I remember those those pictures from the newspapers. Let me ask if there are questions for Rick on this uh, very positive uh, development. Uh, Director Harrison, go ahead. Thank you very much. And I agree. Very positive developments. I too remember those wonderful pictures um, having come out here to visit grandparents in the summer months. Uh, and, and coming from Hawaii to here was quite a shock at that time. So um, I think the big thing is a number one, um, given the amount of population growth that we've had, what significant effort outside of the cars and the improvements that we have that we have in place significant contributed to really bringing that down to a level of immediate attainment? That's the first question I have. Can you address that? Yeah, Rick, can you handle that? Sure, and, and really the um, catalytic converter, um, cleaning, cleaning up the vehicles, that's, that's the big one um, for, for this. So despite uh, increased population, um, the levels have, and increased population, increased VMT vehicles on the road, you know, uh, it's, the levels have gone way down. So that's, that's really the, the big reason up there, up front. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the second question is, from a substantive standpoint, we, we meet attainment. What does that mean for the Denver metro area once we meet attainment? What does that tangibly mean for us? So, Basically, uh, that that means that you know it, it's it's interesting for uh, for CO because all the control measures that are included in the maintenance plan are state regulations, and if we now that we're in attainment and we we no longer really need the maintenance plan, um, that doesn't mean that these state regulations are going to go away. They're still in place. Um, and that's, 
you know, that's uh, also, you know, just to prevent any backsliding and um, those regulations also help uh, regulate other pollutants as well, um, like particulate matter. So, so, and then the other aspect of being in attainment is we won't be required to have as many carbon monoxide monitors throughout the area. Um, I think we'll still have at least one because of the population. Um, maybe maybe one in, uh, in Denver and another one up north somewhere at least. But the good thing about that is um, since carbon monoxide isn't really a, a concern for public health, um, at least the outdoor carbon monoxide, um, we can you know, shift those resources to monitoring other things like ozone, um, you know, so we can potentially increase our ozone uh, monitoring network capabilities. So that's, <clears throat> that's really like the, <clears throat> the big, biggest aspect for something like carbon monoxide. <clears throat> yeah, right. good Thank question. You. Thank you, no more further questions. Thank you. Any other questions for Rick? Really appreciate that, Rick. Uh, having heard the, uh, this uh, presentation yesterday at RTC, it's, uh, it's good to have the entire board uh, share this. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. I see, I'm sorry, uh, Director Levy, I saw your hand go up just now. Yeah, thank, thank you. And I, I don't have a question, really just uh, an observation. Um, I, I moved here in the uh, early 80s, 1982, um, when, you know, we were the butt of national jokes. Um, and it, it's really remarkable to see this progress. And I, I just, it's a tribute to the fact that, or a testament to the fact that, um, you know, regulations, the things that a lot of people hate, can actually make a difference. And, you know, I remember when the regulation to phase out uh, wood burning stoves, unless you, or wood, wood burning fireplaces, unless you had a catalytic converter went into place and, and we had no burn days for fireplaces and all these things. And people just thought that was gonna ruin Colorado. Good, there goes our lifestyle. Um, but you know what, it didn't, um, it still looks pretty good to me out there. Uh, and you know we cleaned up the air. So I, I just think we ought to keep this kind of progress in mind when we think about really big uh, difficult problems like uh, you know now our severe ozone non-attainment status and keep in mind that you know that that there are things that work and uh, and we, we should lean into them. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, Rick, just thank you very much for uh, presenting uh, these last two days. Very much appreciated. Uh, let me move over to my other screen. And we have one more uh, informational briefing from Andy Taylor on MetroVision Performance Measure 2020 status update. Are you ready, Andy? I am ready. Yes, um, you are. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, well, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Um, I'm Andy Taylor. I get to manage the regional planning and analytics teams here at Dr. Cog. Uh, last month, I delivered uh, a briefing with background on MetroVision about its purpose and how it's structured. I explained them that the mission and vision are also Dr. Cog's mission and vision. The overarching themes and outcomes help explain different aspects of our shared aspirational uh, vision for the future and that they really organize all the material on the plan. Um, at the bottom of this framework, you'll see the strategic initiatives. Um, this is where the work of the plan happens. Uh, these are the, the projects and strategies that happen here at Dr. Cog, in your jurisdiction, and with other stakeholders throughout the region. But just above that level, uh, the plan as adopted includes 16 performance measures. Each of those has a 2040 target, and this is the strategic altitude of MetroVision that we'll be focused on tonight. Uh, last month, we had an informational item about the latest available data on these measures in your packet, but I was asked to provide a presentation tonight with this briefing. Uh, instead of trying to track progress on every single voluntary initiative, uh, these measures allow us to check in on a re region's progress 
toward plan outcomes, uh, themes, and the, and the larger vision itself. In short, they ha help us answer the question, are we moving far enough in the desired direction? Uh, these are region-wide measures. Uh, there's no judgment on any specific jurisdiction's contribution. We recognize that different jurisdictions will contribute through different pathways and at different speeds as best fits their local situation. Uh, but uh, this is what we really mean by collective impact, that we are looking region-wide and system-wide. Um, I've got three disclaimers, and then we can dive right in. Um, I'm about to show many straight lines uh, between our baselines and our 2040 targets, uh, but keep in mind that reality is unlikely to show uh, such a direct route. Uh, we have very little historical data for some of these measures, so we're careful not to extrapolate too much. And 2020 affected the performance of some of our measures positively in some cases, uh, but also affected data availability. And we already rely on some data sets with some significant lag to them, whether it's survey data that others compile and aggregate, uh, local data uh, that we must aggregate and compile, as well as other administrative and modeled sources. And so the effects of the pandemic did delay some of these data, data sets quite a bit. Uh, this is the highest level view of the 2020 status of the MetroVision measures. Uh, we're ahead or on track to meet uh, our target for 10 of the 16 measures. We're behind on five, uh, and there's one that we still lack additional observations on. Uh, if you look closely at the item that was in your packet in March, you might notice that two of the measures have moved from no determination to ahead of schedule. Uh, the American Community Survey data from the Census Bureau was finally released uh, mid-March, um, over three months uh, behind its normal scheduled release. And this allowed us to make uh, additional determination um, on these two. Um, I'll be highlighting just four uh, measures, the ones in bold on the next few slides, but I've included all uh, 16, information on all 16 uh, in the packet, just in case there are any questions or you want to look into them further. Um, this is a mock-up of what each of the measure slides lo looks like. Uh, the measure status displays above a table of the different observations. A chart on the right shows a, uh, uh, the observations in orange uh, and the teal line connects the baseline uh, to the 2040 target. Uh, Non-single occupant vehicle trips uh, to work data relies on that uh, delayed Census Bureau data I just mentioned. Um, it's one of the measures where the status change from behind schedule to ahead can really be connected back to the effects of the pandemic and the recession in 2020. Uh, both the, the number of workers went down and the share of those who were consistently working throughout the year and thus more likely to get surveyed were uh, more likely to be teleworking. And uh, even given what we know about our experience in 2020, I'm still surprised by this measure's move. Uh, it actually reflects a five-year survey window uh, that includes responses from 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. And this measure, the entire time we've been looking at it, has been unfortunately rather flat. Um, but um, I was surprised that just one year in that five-year window uh, was enough to see some of this change. Um, I'll, I'll save you all my speculation about the different types of, of bias and survey bias that can happen with the American Community Survey, especially when they shut down, uh, uh, giving those, sending out those, and then oversample later. But it will be interesting to watch this measure uh, over the next couple years. Uh, our region's employment dropped, uh, which was also related to the events of 2020. Despite seeing that 100,000 uh, drop uh, between our 2019 and 2020 observations, we are still on track uh, to meet our target since we were so far ahead previously. Um, this measure is a good example of that path not being a straight line, as you can see the different business cycles uh, along the history of this chart. Uh, the region's share of housing near transit, or high frequency or rapid transit, uh, dropped in 2020. Uh, we've been looking at this one deeper uh, for one of our Denver region data briefs. Uh, RTD's service cutbacks 
really hit this measure hard in 2020. But based just looking at the 2021 service levels, uh, we do expect a decent but not complete rebound. Uh, fatalities uh, resulting from crashes on our region's roadway are increasing, unfortunately. Uh, this data comes from the reports of law enforcement officers. Uh, as was mentioned earlier this meeting, uh, CDOT helps clean and identify those locations uh, from those reports on everything on the state system. And then staff at Dr. Cog do a lot of work uh, to, to make sure those locations and other information is correct on the rest. And, and we were lucky to get that 2020 data from CDOT. Um, uh, it was delayed until December of 2021. So we are still working through this and so we still have to label this as, as preliminary as we make our way through that crash data. But if these preliminary numbers hold, that 2020 number is, is literally off this chart. Um, I'll have to adjust uh, that axis um, uh, because it was such a big increase in 2020. Um, I'll come back to this slide after a, a couple more if there are any questions or discussion um, as the, everything's a high level view here. I'll just point out, um, I've noted seven measures here with asterisk that where we saw a status change uh, that we could directly connect to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and recession. Uh, it can be easy to get lost in all the observations and targets and trying to understand what's causing different trends. But the work that really matters is what's happening at a strategic initiative level. And these are just a few examples of what's happening at the regional level, not just at Dr. Cog. And clearly also we know that there is more happening in your communities to help uh, change the direction collectively on a lot of these measures. And related to measures, what's also next uh, the first half of 2021, uh, we had started discussing potential amendments to MetroVision. We discussed some potential new measures and how to approach uh, new targets, some of which need to be extended out to 2050 to go along with our regional transportation plan. And we're looking to pick up that conversation later this year. Uh, in the meantime, we're also working on data briefs uh, that can share other data and information that illustrates progress towards our shared outcomes. As I mentioned, the next one that will uh, uh, be coming out fairly shortly is one on high frequency transit. And so I know we only looked at four measures, but I'm interested in hearing how these measures help you uh, look at Dr. Cog's priorities, at priorities in your jurisdiction, and really what's helpful from staff's perspective. Does this information help you uh, change what you see as the priorities for us and, and what additional information could, could we provide that might be helpful. And with the permission of the chair, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions about this material or entertain any discussion. Thank you, Andy. And of course, there are, uh, sli there are slides on the other measures that follow this for directors to look at if uh, they want to during the discussion in their packet. Uh, Director uh, Levy, you put a comment in the chat would you, uh, would you want to make that comment here and kick off our discussion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to. Um, I, and, and the comment I put in the chat applies to a couple of other metrics, metrics as well, um, where we know, and, and they're not the ones you highlighted necessarily, but when, when you, you know, connect the dots and you include 2020, which was an anomaly, things look good. <laughs> And um, and I've been scrolling through the rest of the slides, but if you take 2020 out, where would we be? And I, I just I I think we need to be really careful. I'm not a statistician. I'm not a data person at all. So I don't want to I don't want to um, make comments that I'm not qualified to make. But I, you know, when I look at like the slide, it's page 72 of the packet on surface transportation greenhouse gas where we claim we're ahead of schedule. Um, but, you know, if, if you really just were drawing the line out and you took 2020 out when no one was going anywhere, where would we be? And I, so the comment I put in was really, was regarding the uh, 
greenhouse gas, uh, or I'm sorry, the, um, the single occupancy vehicle measure, but it does seem that, you know, we've got a number of these areas where we're feeling pretty good about where we are. But in fact, if you look at the data pre-2020, we really haven't um, made consistent progress. So, um, you know, I just, I guess I just wonder how valid you think um, these conclusions are as to whether we're um, on track or ahead of schedule for some of these ones where 2020 is such an anomaly. Yes. Um, Go ahead. I can answer that. Um, I, I printed off uh, uh, the re report from last year um, and I was looking, we were only uh, on track or ahead on eight measures. Um, and, and yes, some of the ones that flipped from behind schedule to ahead of schedule um, were related directly to vehicle travel. And, and so um, we anticipate that, that some of those trends that we saw in 2020 may not hold and, and, and are not likely to hold from just from our uh, what we've seen happen uh, in the region. So, um, yeah, that is of concern that that we can we can boast about there being 10, but but really um, we've lost some ground on, on a couple. So there's been some switching of places. So, um, yeah, it, it, it does not necessarily look as great as, as 10. Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. And maybe we'll, when we have discussion later on some of the questions that you posed, um, I'll make some other observations. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question, Andy, uh, on uh, your slide nine in my packet here housing near transit. Talk me through again, we're behind schedule, but it shows a precipitous drop in the percentage of housing near transit. Is that because of the number of units being built outside the, uh, the uh, circle of uh, high frequency transit? Or is it because of reductions in transit service during the pandemic uh, that no longer afforded high frequency on some of these corridors that took some of our housing out of that equation? Uh, yes, it was um, the service levels uh, being being okay. cut back Thank significantly. You. Thank you. That's that was my suspicion. I didn't think houses moved anywhere no. uh, that quickly. Uh, Director Nermella, go ahead. I had a question regarding the um, the metric for you know the, in the utility of housing next to transit. Um, just interestingly enough, when I was working out in the Bay Area, um, the analysis done out there um, found by the uh, uh, MTC, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, had looked at um, how transit ridership, the relationship between housing, ridership, and employment, and they found that employment uh, actually gener you know, next to transit, actually generated more ridership than housing. And um, more recently, when I was um, working at Denver, we had looked at um, had there been any move in ridership at RTD transit stops with the introduction of additional housing, and that hadn't really made a big bump. So have we looked at, just sort of analyzed, um, is that metric truly generating the ridership um, that we think it is? Um, we haven't looked at that. Um, I know that RTD does have boarding and alighting data uh, near, uh, especially at the station areas, and that they have been tracking really closely the addition of, of different complexes and, and units uh, near their stations. Um, so, but that is not something that we've looked at directly to see that relationship. But we do see that influence on employment as well and, and do have that also in um, here as a, as a, as a measure, um, which also saw a, a drop. Thank you. Is that all, uh, Director Nomella? Thank you. And Andy, that, uh, that would appear to be also due to the uh, reduction in service levels, correct? Yes. Not That's any correct. move in employment. Thank you, uh, Director Nomella. Very interesting observation. I appreciate hearing that. Any other uh, comments or questions from directors? I see none. Thank you, Andy, that's uh, very interesting. I would suggest directors take time to look through the rest of the uh, 
slides on the, in the packet uh, for the report on other performance measures. Now we move on to uh, item 11, Mr. which Chairman. is information. Yes. It looks like we have a late addition. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, Director Spear. Oh, no, I'm I moved, sorry. I moved I'm... over to my PDF and every, every and, and the Zoom went away. No. Go ahead. No, you're you. fine. I sprained my wrist. And I'm having trouble getting um, getting <laughs> to the the uh, raised hand on time. Um, I just had a question around you know some of these um, performance measures that we're not uh, reaching and what 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 Dr. Cog is kind of thinking of um, in terms of incentives or you know other ways that we might uh, get our communities to really um, push for some of these targets. Um. That's a really good question. Um, we have tried to, um, uh, with the TIP policy that was adopted earlier this year, we have really looked at, at certain set-asides that can help communities plan um, for, as you can see, some of the ones related to urban center housing, urban center employment, and some of the other ones related to growth and development near uh, high frequency or rapid transit. Uh, some of the work that is in our, our work program related to planning around corridors and other sub areas. Um, we are trying to um, uh, encourage um, through funding and, and with the policy that you have adopted um, to try and do more planning in these areas and help try uh, to understand um, why development may not be happening in some of these areas. Um, and so we're trying to also provide some opportunities for um, some technical assistance and trying to utilize some of the data and information that we have. Uh, to just work more closely with um, uh, some of the staff in your jurisdictions to, to help uh, provide some of that insight and, and uh, I'll look a little bit closer because some of these problems are, are shared among uh, the jurisdictions um, and we find that um, we, we can bring together folks. It's a lot easier than it used to be um, to still come together remotely. Um, we're finding the ability to actually uh, engage a lot better um, um, with more jurisdictions um, in that kind of fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Executive Director Rex, do you have a comment to add to that? I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question. I think it's a great question. Um, you know, we intentionally, when we developed the, the Metro Vision Plan back in 2017, um, we wanted that document to be a little more evergreen, Director, um, in that you know, we, we were very intentional about establishing some outcomes that we all believe that it's what we want to be when we grow up so that we could spend more time on the development or sorry, on the implementation of that plan um, and not, you know, get in this cycle of having to continuously update it. So we, so we really wanted to spend a lot of time on implementation. And of course, there was this thing called COVID, which kind of got in the way of that. And you know, we we're only treading water there for a while, right? And really, really uh, kind of spinning our wheels. Um, but I think now, you know, we're coming out of that, that we're going to get a lot more aggressive and, and uh, you, know, pro, you know, be available to our member local governments as uh, sounding boards and support. Um, I think we'd always had hopes of uh, creating some cohorts to work on various uh, uh, strategic initiatives and the like that would help us. And uh, so we'll be, you know, uh, reaching out to see if there are volunteer communities that would like to participate in stuff like that. So stay, stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And I apologize for the late hand raise. Um, I, I thought we were going to come back to the questions that were posed uh, on page 62 of the packet. So, so mm -hmm. that's why I, I uh, didn't yeah, just, just on how this information should change Dr. Cog's strategic priorities, um, I don't have an answer right now, but I think, you know, some of these areas where we are um, not meeting our, our, uh, our goals are really concerning. And I think they do indicate that um, we, you know, they, they all point to better integration of land use planning and transportation they also point to the need to, to have land use um, uh, that supports transit. And um, you know, we, we always just sort of figure, well, local control over land use and even talking about that's the third rail, but th these metrics are really, really important to try to make progress on. And, and so I think I, I would really love to see that discussion here among all these smart leaders from the 
Denver metro area about you know what would it take for for some communities to adopt different uh, land use practices that would better support not just transit um, but you know more walkable communities which um, you know based on the experience here in Boulder County um, have very high value so I, I think there really is a very rich discussion to be had based on this data and I hope we can find some time to do that. Certainly. Uh, thank you, Director Levy. Uh, Director Kelsey, you're up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I too appreciated the question. Um, I guess from a personal standpoint, I feel like um, when, when we get these um, presentations that tell us how we're doing in and rather than go and then patting ourselves on the back when we see so many um, so many of th the things in the um, a ahead of schedule category I kind of take it that the stuff that drags along and is either um, plateaued or behind schedule, um, it just means I need to do some thinking and take it back to my local jurisdiction and see if there, what, what is there that we can do? I, and we're a very small town, so I realize it's a, a little tiny piece, but all the tiny pieces do add up. Um, I don't want to, um, undervalue the, the efforts of small communities um, when you put their efforts and, and um, results from their, their efforts together, it, it can be a large piece of solving the problem. Um, but I agree with, um, with her that um, we, we do need, if there are things that um, Dr. Cogstaff, particularly since you've got your finger on the pulse of so many things that are going on that we're, we're trying, but you know, small towns, you don't always um, see the, the latest and greatest the minute it comes out. And I do appreciate you bringing things to us that help us take um, things back to our local jurisdictions and try and make a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions on this item? Uh, seeing none this time, let's go to uh, uh, item 11, which is uh, an informational item. I was just uh, reviewing that before we switched over. That is uh, the administrative modifications to the 2225 tip. I believe there are four projects that are getting their uh, getting administrative modifications completed. Uh, they are in the packet for your reading uh, afterward. Next is committee reports. And uh, we go first to uh, the stack, uh, Director Maurer. Um, yes, ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, the meeting, the stack meeting on April 14th, um, there was a presentation and discussion on CDOT's development of the policy directive and rule implementation for greenhouse gas pollution standard for transportation planning, um, processes for establishing the greenhouse gas mitigation included how to added measures and approval, how to scoring and an action plan, as well as providing status and reporting. The rule will provide for a formal review period from the Air Pollution Control Division. Um, these mitigation measures will continue to evolve over time as the models increase in sophistication and with additional data from real world impacts. It is expected that some of these measures will even be incorporated into the model. Um, Dr. Cog, um, just so everybody knows, is very involved with working on these mitigation measures and, and looking out for the uh, Dr. Cog region. Uh, there was also a presentation and discussion in regards to CDOT needing to provide guidance and interpretation around two key terms, which we have discussed regionally significant projects and transportation capacity project, 
projects in both these terms are used in environmental provisions in Senate Bill 260, as well as the greenhouse gas planning rule. Um, and, and since we have had discussions about this and there people may want, our directors may be interested in more information, I have asked Melinda to add a link in the chat box to the stack meeting materials so that board members who are interested in that discussion can go there and see what was said. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Melinda is going to put that in the chat or has she? I don't see it there yet. Thank you. Now it is. All right, next is Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chair. The full caucus met live uh, and in person on Wednesday, uh, April the 6th. We had a stimulating discussion on metro mobility and air quality challenges uh, with uh, inputs from uh, uh, Director uh, Shoshana Liu with CDOT, uh, General Manager Deborah Johnson with Dr. Kaig, and our own Executive Director uh, Doug Rex with uh, uh, joining us with that. Uh, we also had a discussion on multi-sector approaches to affordable housing, led uh, initially by Eric uh, Anderson with Prosper Colorado. We also uh, had uh, Mark Falcone with Continuum Partners and Carl Koble with uh, Koble & Company to provide a, a, a developer's perspective on how we might be able to uh, construct more affordable housing in our neighborhoods, which uh, we all agree is uh, much needed. And uh, so that concludes my report. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Thank you, Chair Flynn. We had a meeting last Friday, April 15th, there at Dr. Cog, and you've heard both our chair and, and executive director talk about the pilot program to support MAC. All of our county commissioners and uh, MAC are very grateful for that support. Um, this was our first meeting on Friday <clears throat> that would focus on our 2022 priority of housing homelessness, homelessness. We had presentations from the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless and the Metro Denver Housing Initiative. That was Kathy Alderman and Dr. Jamie Reif. Um, the presentations were aimed at providing foundational information about homelessness in our region and led to a to a discussion of what books we should all read. So we shared uh, recommendations for books on the subject of homelessness. We're gonna spend the next two meetings, the next two meetings every month, talking about what each county in the region is doing in terms of homelessness. Hopefully all the counties will incorporate what their uh, cities and towns uh, or other regional um, initiatives are doing in terms of homelessness, including data and specific programs that uh, have been put in place. Uh, the purpose of this series of meetings is to build more understanding about homelessness for the county commissioners so that we can address the same issue in a more uh, informed and coordinated fashion. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Next up is Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Jay Sanchez Warren. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi. Uh, I, I didn't get the, uh, I didn't think about this in time, but I, one of the things that the Advisory Committee on Aging saw was the new um, rebranding of the AAA. And I didn't coordinate with Steve Erickson or else I could have showed you kind of our new logo and the new rebranding, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get that to you uh, at another meeting. We also had a legislative update uh, from Rich Morrow, the same things that you talked about this evening. Then we did some kind of house cleaning. We, we changed our meeting date of the ACA. It's now gonna be on the fourth Friday of every month um, from uh, 11 to two or 11 to one, sorry. Uh, and then we reviewed the ACA committee guidelines. So other than the rebranding, it was, kind of a standard meeting. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next up, Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We met on April 1st and a couple items of note. We, uh, we now have a new vice chair. Um, her name is uh, Allie Johnson. She's a council member for, from the uh, city of Evans, Colorado. So we congratulated her on her appointment. Um, it's all, I've said this before, it's, it's all SIP all the time at, 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 uh, at the rack right now. 
Um, so they took us through various elements of the plan, just educating the board in uh, preparation of the next uh, state implementation plan. Um, we had a presentation on the vehicle inspection and maintenance program, um, the non-attainment new source review permitting controls program, uh, regional reasonably available control technology or RAT, um, the major penalty source uh, fee program, and reasonable further progress requirements. And all these are elements that are that are uh, that have to be in the SIP. So it's obviously a very important education for us, and it makes me sound smart. More importantly, so there you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I believe next up is uh, E470, uh, Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, E470 board met on April 14th, uh, last Thursday. Uh, Hazmat route, our uh, first item up was the Hazmat route designation for E470. It will be effective on April 1st of 2022. <laughs> Intended to complement the metro region's ability to handle vehicles that carry placardable hazardous materials and the ability to address an emergency. So enable planning and response, mitigate risks to communities and environment. Now, uh, one thing to note is that E-470 permission does not include nuclear materials, uh, all nuclear materials. Uh, after that, we did a review update for Q1 in terms of uh, usage on E-470. Uh, usage is nearly back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, over half of the usage, however, is in the Southeast plazas, uh, Lone Tree to Aurora. Uh, traffic, uh, truck traffic is increasing uh, up by 19%. We're unable to identify if toll uh, decrease that was launched earlier this year is impacting traffic volume but the data does show an effect uh, that the Omicron scare that we had, as well as uh, February being our synovious month, uh, did affect uh, traffic levels. Uh, we're also watching for additional factors that could impact traffic on the tollway, uh, such as inflation, uh, accident events, and of course, everybody's favorite, fuel prices. Um, we are watching for the impact of I-25 ramp metering uh, along I-25, um, but we're not really seeing, we don't believe we're seeing an effect on that yet. We did receive an update on uh, the relationship that the E-470 has with CTIO, which many of you will remember is the former name for HTPE and um, the agreement for back office services that E-470 provides. Uh, finally, we did have uh, our, the new executive director of E470, Bo Memory. And those of you who know me, yes, I am working up a host of uh, puns and jokes related to his last name. He'll be starting later this month. And of course, we all did a very formal uh, and, and sad and fond farewell to um, our, uh, Tim, our prior uh, executive director for the last few years to include an appearance by Executive Director Rex. That is my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Director Thiel. Uh, next up, CDOT, uh, Director White, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, quick update tonight under a common theme of grants, grants, grants. Uh, so wanted to give the board uh, an update on our uh, CDOT's progress to uh, keep up with and apply for many of the federal grant opportunities in the federal infrastructure bill. The board will probably recall that Congress put a lot of money in competitive grants um, and those uh, notice of funding availabilities are starting to come out. So we recently submitted applications for the RAISE grant opportunity. Um, two of the three of those were in the Dr. Cog area. This was to rebuild the US-6 and Wadsworth interchange, which has been on our list for a long time and also a series of investments on along State Highway 119. Our third project was on the Western Slope to connect a series of mobility hubs from Grand Junction to Glenwood Springs and help increase transit there. So with those behind us, we're now preparing for mega grants, which is several grants sort of tucked under this umbrella that they're, they're um, terming mega. There's also scenic byways and wildlife grants that we're expecting to come out soon. 
So that's on the federal level. And then I just wanted to take an opportunity to say we've recently released our own grant announcement within CDOT for transportation demand management grants. I will put that link in the website and certainly encourage you all to share that with your cities and counties. We're sort of excited to be able to further support some of the transportation demand management programs and build on the good work Dr. Cog has done in this area over many, many years. That's it for me tonight. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see RTD here for a fast tracks update, so we will skip over that. Before we go to administrative items, just want to remind uh, all the uh, members of the directors rather that in the chat, when we close the Zoom meeting, the chat goes away, unless you've been copying it all along. If there are links in there that you want to follow up after the meeting or tomorrow, uh, please take your time now before the meeting ends to uh, make copies of the, uh, of the links. Administrative items, our next meeting is May 18. And I just wanna make note of this uh, occasion that we will be entering our new normal. Uh, once again, thanks to staff for piloting us through, and we look forward to seeing all of you in three dimensions next month. Uh, are there other matters by members? Please raise your hand if you have other matters. I see none. Uh, I'll give it a few more seconds because I've been rather quick flipping through screens and missed a few earlier. I see none. So uh, with no other business before the board of directors, this meeting is now adjourned. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Um, bye, -bye. Bye. 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 Thanks and good night. Thank, Thank you. you.